And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first ever eTool Nation podcast. I am CAP retired John Wayne Troxel, brand ambassador for Veterans Lending Group. Got my tag team partner here, uh, Fonz. Introduce yourself. Aloha, Alfonso Ramos Jr. here. Always a pleasure to be spending some time with you. Can't wait to have a good talk and conversation with you. And our first two guests today uh, are Mike and Brooke Villano, the leadership of Veterans Lending Group. Before we get to them, we want to talk about why we're here, first of all, and why the eTool Nation podcast. So we felt that we needed a forum that we could talk about key issues affecting service members, their families, and veterans. Uh, and that's what we're going to do here today. And if anybody knows what the eTool Nation is all about, uh, basically, it's about anything you do in life, you're willing to take an entrenching tool and use it as a weapon to bash that problem uh, into submission or neutralize it, whether it's an enemy threat Boom. or something going on in your life or whatever it is. And so that's why we're here today. So Mike and Brooke, our first guests that we've ever had on the show. Thank you both so much for being here today. Yeah. Thank you for having invite. us. Appreciate it. Excited. Awesome. Hey, so... The agenda we're going to kind of follow Let's before we get into asking you, Mike and Brooke, about how you guys do business as uh, business owners and how you get after leadership and how do you get after building cohesive teams. Um, let's talk about some current events that's going on. Fonz, what's been going on in the world today that we need to talk about, brother? Afghanistan. The withdrawal or the exit of Afghanistan and how many people is it affecting not only the locals there in Afghanistan, but also our very own, our service members, us here, the people on this podcast. Yeah. So this has been on my mind a lot um, ever since, uh, you know, we decided to exit. Um, folks may know that in 2011 and 12, I was the senior enlisted leader of the operational headquarters there, the ISAF Joint Command that was responsible for day-to-day -day combat operations. And I traveled to every province within Afghanistan. I patrolled with every battalion size organization, U.S. and multinational, and uh, like Afghan organizations. And uh, I'm really concerned. You know, I, I uh, our, our military is doing phenomenal work. Our military leaders are executing policy that is dictated to them and making the best of it. But I will tell you, you know, we started a disciplined, protracted, orderly withdrawal when I was there 10 years ago. In December of 2011, we were at about 130,000 troops. We had to get down to 120,000 by the 31st of December. And we started shoving troops in the back of C-130s and C-17s to get them out of the country so we could meet uh, what our elected officials told us the number we had to get to. And then over the years, we went to 113,000. Then we made a drastic move down to below 15,000. And when I was the SEAC, the numbers went from 8,400 and continued to trickle down to just a couple months ago when it was 2,500. So we had this disciplined, orderly, protracted withdrawal that was going on that gave time and space to the Afghan government and the Afghan forces to continue to get after operations. We were still assisting, you know, with air power and intelligence and logistics and with doing counterterrorism operations. And then all of a sudden, on the 14th of April, the president says we're getting out. And I will tell you, getting out is a big deal uh, because you know, we were the ones that uh, had the Afghan military on our payroll. And when you think of those young privates in the Afghan military, uh, depending on that paycheck now, who's going to pay them? Mm -hmm. Second of all, um, you know, uh, we, we live by this phrase, Shona by Shona, for 20 years, meaning shoulder to shoulder, U.S. and Afghan forces, shoulder to shoulder. And we reinforced it at the tactical level where relationships are transformational, not transactional. We reinforced it. These were our brothers and sisters and we were fighting together. And all of a sudden we're leaving. And we took this discipline process and in my opinion, I'm not speaking on behalf of the DOD, 
This is John Wayne Troxell's opinion. We made it an undisciplined, precipitous exit. And when you, when you talk about a non-combatant evacuation operation, um, there's stages for that. One, a NEO operation has to have secure corridors that can get people in and out, especially Americans, third national citizens, uh, third country citizens, and others that need to get out, our trusted Afghans and everything. Second of all, the troops aren't the first ones you pull out. They're the last ones you pull out. Mm -hmm. You get these uh, displaced civilians, American citizens, all of them out. Then we, you know, being good stewards of the resources, the American taxpayer gives us, let's get the equipment out. And then the last people to leave are the troops. Sure. And we kind of did that in the opposite direction. But I'll say this. Um, anybody that served in Afghanistan, this is not a failure over 20 years. I will tell you that we took a nation that was just crumbled where about 7% of the female population was literate in 2001. Uh, overall, the, the about 44% of the entire population was literate. Uh, and we turned this into a country where women had rights. Um, the Afghan government, although there was still corruption in it, was building the Afghan armed forces, although there were challenges, was building and they were able to take the fight to the Taliban, ISIS and Al Qaeda. And we only had 2,500 troops in there at one time. And all we were doing mainly was security force assistance. We were doing counterterrorism operations with our elite special operations forces, but that was very small. And we had not had a combat casualty for 18 months in Afghanistan. So the question is this, I know the American people want the men and women home. They don't want these, what they're calling endless wars. They want, and, and I hear the phrase all the time, and God bless our American citizens, until all the troops come home. John Wayne Troxell's opinion, we don't live in that world anymore, and we can't live in that world anymore. If we all of a sudden have all the troops home, and we take on a potential isolationist kind of approach, we will give time and space to not only terrorist organizations, but the Chinese and the Russians to gain competitive advantages over us, not only in the military realm, but economically, diplomatically, and uh, in the information domain. So the bottom line is, in my opinion, were we still fighting a war in Afghanistan? In my opinion, uh, Again, we were building a nation. We were building a military. We were denying safe havens to global terrorist organizations who have shown in the past to attack targets in Paris, in Brussels, in New York City, and Washington, D.C. So I'll end with that right there. In my opinion, uh, this was a hasty exit that we could have done a lot better. And in my opinion, uh, you know, this was not the way to go. It's, it seemed awfully, you know, like a knife switch, you know, I mean, it really was. And I, and I, and I you know, in, in speaking with you, John, and learning, you know, going from 130,000 down to 2,500, uh, I guess I just didn't, under, I don't understand why it was just, you know, I just don't understand why more time wasn't taken uh, to do what you just said and just kind of walk it through. I think what you said is, is right on the money. Uh, the exit is, is crucial. Um, and so I, I just feel like the way they did it, man, it sure did put a lot of people in uh, in harm's way. I mean, it really just stirred everything up. And uh, and, and like you were saying, Fonz, I mean, it's a, a, on this side and those there. It's man. Yeah. And I think I, I, I think I think our military leaders are executing policy. Sure. I don't think, you know, knowing the senior leadership in the DOD, um, knowing them very well and having served with them in combat. Mm -hmm. the secretary and the chairman, in my opinion, they're, they're following policy from the white house. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and certainly the troops on the ground and the, and the, you know, the, the, so what now is we've got authorized 6,000 troops on the ground, you know, a bunch of soldiers and Marines, special operators, our airmen are there and everything. Uh, we even got sailors on the ground too. Now the mission is we got to support them. And we got to make sure that they have what they need to do to accomplish the mission. And think of this. They are guarding the airfield. They have it secured. We are getting evacuation flights out. 
There's three different checkpoints on uh, Ky Kabul International Airport. I know that place well. That's where my headquarters was for a year. And they're getting people in and getting them out. We've got a lot of work to do. But think of the U.S. troops that are there now, the situation that they have to handle. Mm -hmm. And especially being in an environment where right outside the gate, they are surrounded by a ruthless terrorist organization, the Taliban. And now we have to conduct diplomacy with the terrorist organization. So my heart goes out to those troops there. They're in my prayers. They are going to do fine work. They are going to get the job done. And uh, to anybody that served for the past 20 years, uh, this was not in vain. I'm telling you, we have shown what the American military machine can do, not only with how we can take the fight to our enemies, but the humanitarian efforts we can put forth to give people a better life. This was not in vain. And all of us should be proud that served in Afghanistan. And also, we should honor those almost 2,400 Americans that made the ultimate sacrifice, not only for freedom for our nation, but freedom for Afghanistan. Absolutely. Go ahead, Brooke. Oh, I was just going to say, we had talked about this a little bit yesterday, but you know, when we left after the Korean War, we stayed and had a presence in Korea to ensure that everything was maintained. What had been created was maintained. And so that's the part that's confusing for me. I, I listened to a podcast yesterday and they said 80% of the displaced Afghanistan or Afghanis are women and children. And um, and it's heartbreaking. And those that are leaving are young men mm -hmm. because they're most at risk, you know, to be hunted down and gunned down by the Taliban. So, you know, it's, it feels like we're going far, you know, it's, it's going backwards very quickly back to the place where women and children could potentially be at risk. And I know the Taliban is saying that they're going to protect the women and children, but already they were painting over female broadcasters. Yeah. Uh, pictures in from what I saw online and I don't know if it's accurate but that's what I saw so it's an interesting interesting um strategy yeah go ahead Fonz so I have a quick question for for all you so one acronym that was taught to me early on in my career to kind of analyze leadership was BLTD if you ask a Marine what BLT stands for the first thing they're going to say battalion landing team which we do have battalion landing team a uh, one eight out in Afghanistan right now with the 24th Mew. And that's was part of the initial 3000 uh, men and young men and women that we sent in uniform there. But so it's be with your, your people, lead your people, train your people and defend your people. So my question to you three is with the D defend your people, specifically the words, the buck stops with me. Huh. Right. So one of the things that we heard, and like John was saying, right, our administ our our the military's only executing policy. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things was it was highly unlikely that the Taliban would take control of Afghanistan as fast as they did. Mm -hmm. So with that said, because that plays a lot into our evacuation plan, right? Whatever plans we had post. The, whatever uh, treaty that we we were making or whatnot, but what do you think, uh, John, with that? So um, I will tell you, you know, senior leaders can say one thing, and God bless all our senior leaders, but if you want to know what's going on with where the rubber meets the road, then you got to ask the people that have been there and done that. And most of the folks will tell you at the tactical level, that without U.S. support, the Afghans are very vulnerable. And it's because, you know, even though we've been doing this for 20 years and it seems like a long time, you want to get them to where they can control uh, all the elements of national power and be successful against these terrorists. We still got work to do. And guess what? A small footprint of 2,500 was getting the job done. Was there a threat? Absolutely. But you know, we've we've had troops in places like Somalia, Yemen, Libya and these other places that were doing light kind of activities. And Brooke brings up a great point. 1953, when we signed the armistice with Korea, we kept troops in that country. And there have been troops that have been killed in action by North Koreans 
over the 68 years since. You know, most recently, the other day, was the anniversary of the axe murder incident, you know, where the North Koreans uh, didn't like the Americans chopping down a tree and they end up taking axes to uh, two of our officers there and killed them, you know, which almost led us into back into the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. So um, I think when, uh, you know, when we when we say, hey, look, you know, they're not going to fall. I think that's an estimate from folks that are looking at the conditions. So 300,000 Afghan troops, um, they've got a capable air force and all of these things, but they did not look at one of the critical things. And that is the will and resolve to fight and for leaders to lead by example and keep their soldiers there to fight. You cannot teach will and resolve. Either you have it or you don't have it. Obviously, you know, combat training and combat will assist with that. But in the end, that's what uh, was the downfall. And I think for anybody that has partnered with the Afghans at the platoon or squad, platoon, company, battalion level, the most of them would have said, hey, if, if we leave, there's a good chance this is going to happen. So um, our intelligence agencies, you know, that are very good, you know, gave their best intel estimate on it. Our senior leaders took the best look they could to it based on the guidance they were getting from the commander in chief. And uh, and in the end, you know, here's what we, we end up with, a shit sandwich, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting too, that when you're out speaking at these military bases, you're talking about fight and win. And that's yeah. the difference between the US military force and potentially the Afghan force, because you're, you know, it's constantly remotivating the troops. It's constantly getting them to understand why it's so important to to fight and win. Why it's so important to be physically, mentally, and emotionally prepared for that. So it's yeah. uh, it's disappointing, yeah. but you know, I hope, hopefully, like you said, the the what we've accomplished in the last twenty years. There's been good things. Um, a lot of great has been accomplished and hopefully maybe maybe there will be some reestablishment of the government in Afghanistan and maybe they can pull it out and figure out a way to make this work. Yeah. And here's the other thing I would tell you, Brooke, just 10 years ago, 10 years ago, 100 percent of our patrols in Afghanistan were partnered. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of the wounded and killed on those patrols U.S. and Afghan were U.S. So the point back then was we were still, even though we were partnering and the Afghans were supposed to be in the lead, you know how we Americans are. If you want to get a job done and do, you're going to do it right, then, and if you can't get it right, then we're going to get it right. So even then, you know, as an institution in the U.S. Army, we started looking at how do we build units that will not be as aggressive as our traditional units, they won't have the capability to be aggressive, but they can provide best military advice, um, training, and uh, and everything to get the Afghans. So we built these security force assistance brigades, and we even you know and and that's kind of what we were doing in Afghanistan at the end is building partner capacity. We were doing counterterrorism to keep you know key Taliban leaders, Al Qaeda, ISIS, you know, and getting after that. But we were not conducting combat operations. We were building a capacity in the Afghans. And in some cases where we say advise and assist in a company, which we've done in the past in places like Colombia, in places like Somalia and Libya and things like that, you know, all of that is in the past. Now it's advise and assist and let the unit go out and do the action on its own. And it is an effective way and it's shown to be an effective way to build that necessary partner capacity so they can defend their own sovereign territory. And it builds that confidence in them to be able to do it. We were in the embryonic stages of doing that, in my opinion, with Afghanistan. And had we given more time, I think we could have got them to a point where I don't think we should have pulled out altogether, but I think we could have kept this residual force mm -hmm. to do security force assistance. And we would have continued to be able to keep Afghanistan uh, with the, the legitimate government in it 
and the armed forces still uh, and the uh, police forces providing security for the nation. Now, John, as you know, we have great partnerships all over this world, right? We were not alone there in Afghanistan, right? Yep. We, we fought alongside our brothers and sisters from various other countries. Nations. So what, what do you say they're, they're feeling just like we're feeling right now, right? And they're seeing what's going on. Right? What would you, what comes to your mind? What would you say to them? So I'll give you a quick story. So the command chief here at the fifth bomb wing here at Minot where I'm at is a guy named Tim Wisner. And we were in Afghanistan at the same time. And he did a lot in a place called Kapisa province. And uh, which is the province just to the east of Kabul. And it's a launching point for Taliban and terrorists because they've got multiple routes to get into Kabul and do spectacular attacks. Kapisa province, when I was there, was held by the French. And it was the French Airborne Brigade that was there. And they were some fighting motherfuckers, man. Excuse my language. No, and no. I went out there to patrol with them all the time. Uh, I did a lot of things with those guys. And they were some fighting individuals. Well, one night they got into a fight in the uh, Alashe Valley, which goes from uh, that province to the province further to the east. And they got into a serious fight and seven uh, French paratroopers got killed. There were some innocent Afghan civilians that got killed. And President Sarkozy immediately said, I'm pulling all of our French forces out. So I made the trip to Fab Tagab there in Kapisa to talk to those guys after that. And they were devastated. This, this brigade of proud French paratroopers were devastated that the rest of the coalition and their U.S. brothers and their Afghan brothers and sisters were going to continue the fight and they had to go home. So the will of the country quit on the troops on the ground and they left. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell you that our partners, I mean, you know, whether it's the Brits or whoever, the other 49 nations that participated in the 20 year coalition, um, they're disappointed. I can guarantee you that. But in the end, we are such a trusted partner militarily that they're going to understand that this was a political decision. It wasn't a decision made by our military. And I don't think it's going to affect our partnerships with these other countries' militaries because of the close relationships we have, Fonz. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I was just going to say, speaking of that, it's something that I've seen just from, uh, you know, my friends that that had, that were in Afghanistan and, and talking about these partnerships that you speak on, Fonz, uh, what I can say is how impressive that it has been <clears throat> to see everybody come together and reach out to protect anybody that is there. Uh, you can tell. I mean, right now, this is people that, you know, that, and I'm sure you guys have these relationships. You, you really care about these people. They really were your brothers. Uh, I, I have I have a couple friends that they are really close and they're man, they have formed a, a whole network to help, you know, to help and, and try to just provide information, relay information. Go here. Stop here. Don't go. Here. Uh, and, and it, you know, it speaks to our military as a whole. I think that's one of the things we love uh, at Veterans Living Group about hiring, you know, and, and working so close with military. Man, no one's sitting around whining this and that, whatever. They go right into action and just start looking out for the people that they spent that time with. Uh, and, you know, as a civilian on the outside looking in. And looking at the people that we're lucky to work with, that I, you know, I just wanted to say, I, I think that is is impressive, uh, not surprising at all, but really cool to see. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you, in, in to close out our uh, current events portion here, we've been talking at Afghanistan. I think all of us are in agreement that uh, you know we'll continue to pray for our troops that are over there. They have a tough mission, uh, and uh, the conditions are very dangerous, uh, but. You know, the, the United States military is the most respected military on the planet. And it's because of those men and women over there right now at the tactical level that are getting after that mission and are not only just going to survive in that environment, they're going to thrive and they're going to get the job done regardless of how bad the, the conditions are. So I think we all ought to give them a prayer and a salute uh, and uh, keep them in our thoughts. Amen. Absolutely. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you're watching E-Tool Nation podcast. We're going to take a quick break right now. 
for this message from Veterans Lending Group. At Veterans Lending Group, we're not just VA home loan specialists. We are educators, community leaders, military service members, or family of those who serve. We are committed to serving, supporting, and educating our military families. 60% of our staff are prior service or spouses, and 85% of the loans we close are VA loans. We are your special ops of VA lending. We will not restrict your VA home loan benefit like many other lenders do. We believe that you have earned this benefit through your service, and we are here to protect your right to use it the way the VA wrote the guidelines. Our team can lend in all 50 states. We are here to assist you with your next home purchase or refinance, whether you are PCSing, transitioning, or retiring. Our team of specialists are here to support your family. Visit our website today to connect with a VA specialist, www.veteranslendinggroup.com. Awesome. Welcome back to the eTool Nation podcast. I'm SEAC retired John Wayne Troxel. I've got the biggest, baddest Marine that has ever served, Sergeant Major retired Alfonso Ramos Jr., I know there'll be about 183,000 Marines that will rebut that statement that are serving <laughs> on active duty right now, but um, you are the, the BMF as far as I'm concerned. And our special guests, Mike and Brooke Milano, uh, the hierarchy of Veterans Lending Group. So, Mike, right before we went to the commercial break, uh, we talked about um, how, we're, how Veterans Lending Group does business. And so you talked about, you know, you know, the, the veterans and family members you have. So what kind of conversations have you all been having with this Afghanistan uh, abrupt exit and everything with your employees who have served or their spouse may have served over there? How are yeah. you guys getting after this? Man, we, uh, I guess to answer the first question, open conversations. Uh, you know, whether it's telling stories, you know, uh, I've had some guys that are venting frustration. Uh, I have guys that are just trying to relate to it. They weren't in Afghanistan. They were in Iraq or they were elsewhere, uh, but they understand the premise. They, they've been there and they've served. And, you know, whatever emotions they uh, they have, we're, we're letting them out. Uh, and, and that's really kind of it. Aside from, you know, immediately everyone kind of goes into action at VLG as well. You know, we are primarily military, so everyone operates very similarly. Uh, so we dig in and we we try to get resources, right? That's the first thing. We, we start with us always, but we try to get some kind of additional resources where it's like, here you go. Here's a few other avenues besides us. Um, you know, we encourage everybody to, to speak and talk and, and you know, and speak their mind. Turn to eat, whether, it, whether it's your partner next to you, whether it's me, Brooke, uh, branch manager, whoever you feel comfortable with. Um, you know, and then from the other side of it, man, we just try to open our eyes and, and watch and, and see what we're seeing because not everybody does start talking. And, uh, and I think that that's real important. You know, maybe if you, we know, we, you know, we're not so big that we don't know our, our, uh, our teammates. Um, and you can tell if, if someone's a little bit, maybe a little distracted, maybe a little quieter than normal, um, their behavior just looks a little bit off. We make it a point to stop what we're doing and just go up to them. How you doing, man? What's going on? What's on your mind? Um, it, it's very simple, you know, and I, and I think that is really kind of where it's at. Our, our work is important. Um, but the work is always there and it always gets done, you know, and really when you treat the people and uh, I, I just we I think we believe that's where you start and you, you got to take time for, for people to, uh, you know, if you get derailed, you got to get you got to get back on that track, man. And sometimes that, that happens in five minutes and sometimes it takes a few days or whatever. And, and we're, we're just trying to be open to uh, allow for that time and, and get everybody on track and, and, and healed as best that, that we can as employers. Awesome. Go ahead, Fonz. I have a quick question for Brooke. So one of our values is elevation. And I'm going to read it off because it's powerful. And I think that has a lot to say about our current state and the support that you provide each and every one of our family, VLG life family. Mm -hmm. So elevation, we understand that we have a responsibility to each other. We support our community through education, volunteerism, and creating a worthwhile experience. We support each other through mutual respect while maintaining a workplace built around our strengths and a lot of laughing by believing in something larger than each one of us. We are creating something that will outlast all of us. We will inspire others 
to follow in our footsteps. Hashtag elevate. Boom. Oh, man, love it. <laughs> boom. Yeah. You can't end that without a boom. I'm sorry. Right. That's. So, so what, how what, do, what was your question? How do you utilize the values that we have here at Veterans Lending Group, right, to instill that physical uh, dis discipline, mental discipline, emotional discipline, just to help them through uh, any challenges that, that, you know, we may be going through. And one of them is like what we were talking about earlier, uh, half of the show, which is Afghanistan. Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, you know, that's evolved over the years because when we first started working, when we first started Veterans Lending Group, we were only in a, a group of 11 people and now we're 140 and we continue to grow. We have, you know, prior service and spouses combined in teams working with us. And so we have, you know, because of we're 60 percent prior service and spouses, that's our number percentage of employees that work for us. We deal with a lot of things that come up from transitioning. You know, we have employees PCSing all across the country right now, and we're accommodating the active duty spouses because we don't want them to be in a situation where they couldn't keep their job, where they couldn't have a career, they couldn't have their own identity. So we support them in being able to do that. We support them with mentorship and training. I would rather take somebody fresh out of military, out of the military, just transitioning out. I would rather spend all of our time and energy training them and teaching them this great opportunity for a new career than take someone who's already a mortgage lender with a pinky ring and a purple tie at another mortgage company and try and fit them into our mold because they don't fit into our mold. That's an eight inch tie. She was supposed to say eight inch tie. Eight yeah. inch tie, sorry, short one. So, hey, so yeah so on that point um i have to tell you you know i've been with veterans lending group you know i met you guys first when sandra and i were at the most vulnerable part of our transition um we were retiring from an institution that we had been with for 38 years and we were doing something that is also an emotional decision that's buying a home are you buying the right home? Are you getting the best value for your home? All of these things weigh on you, you know? And uh, and then we met you and Mike and it was like we had met family. You know, your, your demeanor, your uh, charisma, your style. And then when we sat down to business, the business acumen, and then just the caring, it was everything that the military does to develop leaders. But I thought, these are two of the most phenomenal uh, leaders in business I've ever met. Um, how do you get there? You know, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna give both of you outstanding leaders. I, I used to say this all the time. People hate talking about themselves, but I, if you put a time limit on it, then they will. I'm gonna give you each 30 seconds oh. to talk about what makes you tick and why you think. Um, that the company is the way it is in terms of awesome command climate. Hmm. Mike, you're first. I'm you're first. On the clock right now. Okay. okay. You know, I, I think uh, I think you kind of said it, man. The first thing you have to do is care. Uh, you know, it starts with that, and that's where it kind of was when, when we started off. You know, John, kind of like you said, we're pretty no bullshit, man. I don't have yeah. a whole lot of filters that I can put up in there. Uh, you know, you kind of get what you get, man. And I was blue collar for a lot of years. I wasn't in here punching keys and counting money. Um, you know, I, I was working my ass off, man, in some really terrible conditions a lot of the time. Um, and, and so I understood that. And when I started initially, and we were doing this and I started working with military, for me, there was just a connection. These were my people. I did not serve. Okay. And, and, and but we still had crossed a lot of the same bridges, man. And we could just hang and we could kind of get it. Um, I think it was easier for me because I didn't come at people with all the, you know, the color that is lending and mortgage and all this, you know, ugh. Um, and so, and I think that's it. I think it's just a willingness to do that and go, Hey man, here it is. I'm not going to use big fancy words with you. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to try to educate you and make sure you know what you're doing. Um, and, and we carry that all the way through, whether I'm talking to you as a client or, or some of my partners, I don't even say employees, man. I just have a team, you know, there is no, yeah. like we don't, we don't roll with rank like that. Um, you know, we all have different jobs, but, but at the same time we have the same mission. Um, and, and I think that that is really it, man. You just have to care. You got to take the time with people and be real and be available to them. Um, you know, there, there isn't any time that anyone in my company can't reach out to me directly and I'll pick up my phone and I'll talk to them about whatever it is we need to talk about. I don't care. 
um, you know, that that's just kind of what it is. So for, for me, um, I believe that that approach really makes it kind of like you said, kind of a family style, comfortable workplace where, you know what, man, they, they know I've got their back. They know I'm up there leading from the front and I'm open to discuss anything at any time. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm approachable like that. And I, I don't know. I think it I think it helps. I think I think they appreciate it. All right, Brooke. Wait, did he get his yeah, did I go over No, out? he was. No, he he owes <laughs> two laps on Chambers Bay. <laughs> with that a was stone. Over. I was even trying to talk. But you give me the time to talk about, man, I'll just run away with it. Hey, so two laps with the 100 pound stone Chambers Bay. The oh. next time you're up there, brother. Hey, you're the pack too. mule, man. I can do two. Yeah, that's nothing. <laughs> Go ahead, Brooke. So I have a servant's heart. And I think for me, um, it's black and white, what's right and wrong. And what we're doing for, you know, the opportunity that we're providing, that's what we, that's what I get excited to wake up to every single day. Because I see these military families that sacrifice so much for us and the freedom for my kids. And I know it sounds cliche, but I truly... I truly authentically appreciate that. And I wanna do what I can to pay it back and pay it forward. And so every day I wake up with the goal of what can I do to help these military families? How can we assist them through, you know, when they're struggling, how can we assist them through that? Whether it's, you know, relationship issues or financial issues or just changing, transitioning career. What can we do to give them the assistance to make them feel like they have a home environment and to give them, you know, a team of people that they can trust people that will not turn their backs on them. Really, it's recreating the military environment that they come from. And it's recreating that camaraderie, that family, that, you know, that team and the mission. We have a mission. And I think our military families love that because they have a mission that continues beyond their career in the military. And so they feel like they have purpose. Yeah. So for us, if you have purpose, if you have the guidance and the team and you have the community, I don't know how you can't be successful with that. And and understanding that there may be times that you have to put a coat of scunion on somebody for oh, yeah. you know fucking some shit up. You know? <laughs> yeah. We've done that. Yeah. yeah, and it's business. It's not personal. No. You know, no. it's, it's born out of love, not hate. If That's you, right. If, if you hated them, you wouldn't even correct them. You'd let them keep screwing up and get rid of them. But you love them. So you rip their ass and say, get back to work, give them, yeah. give them a big hug and, and get after it. Right? I literally said that to somebody the other day. And I was like, I heard your leadership talk and I'm doing this because I love you, but I'm checking your ass mm -hmm. and, and you're <laughs> you going to be better because of it. Absolutely. Go ahead, Fonz. So I had the pleasure of meeting one of our teammates uh, last week, Kevin Miracle. Oh. And we had a great conversation probably sat down and talked for about an hour to an hour and a half. And most of the conversation was about you two, believe it or not, oh. Mike and Brooke Viano. And oh. the, the biggest thing that, that he had that was really amazing. And, and I'll ask you a really a two part question here. The first one is, is about how you both conduct business. And the second one is about the American dream. Mm -hmm. But what he absolutely loved, and loves about VLG is the fact that, like you mentioned, Mike, you have an open door policy. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing to him that he's able to give you a call at any time of the day for really any question. And that you'll drop everything that you're doing to support him and, and his endeavor on making the team great. So what all the employees across Veterans Lending Group or our team members and every anybody out there that needs any information related to what we do here. And we're not just VA home loan specialists. We are educators, community leaders. We support and they serve our military families, right? our veterans and our service members. Mm -hmm. So what what is so unique about you, your mindset about maintaining a open door policy, Mike? Um, man, I guess I just, I don't know any other way. I think, I guess if I back up, I would say this. We, Brooke and I hate to get up here and say kind of like what she just said. We're really more show and go, man. I mean, we feel like we should just shut up and prove it. Mm -hmm. And like people will see it. 
Uh, and that's the way we operate. Uh, we, you know, when Brooke said whatever she was saying there and said, I know it's cliche. It, it is cliche. Everyone in the world says this shit. So, you know, for us, it's, it's just very important to shut up and get out there and do, you know, what, what do you do? If you say you're going to support and you're going to help military, then what do you do? You start hiring and you start educating and you train and you have an open door policy to make sure that, you know, when these guys come in and they're not feeling good about something, man, they can go to whoever it is they trust. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's Brooke. Maybe it's one of the other however many leaders we have. But they know that they've got that resource. And especially in this industry, you know, it's something that Brooke and I know. I mean, we've seen it forever. Brooke, longer than me, um, is that, you know, training is a real problem. And we had also learned that when you separate from the military and you go over into the civilian side, it's very difficult, man. A lot of employers, they don't get it and they don't take the time to get it. Um, you know, and for us, that was just part of kind of putting one foot forward and going, okay, we're going to do this. Uh, we wanted to dig in and really see where it was and find the weak spots and fill them. Um, and, and so I, I hope I'm answering your question, brother. I, I, uh, I mean, for me, that's just, it's just one part of a entire plan that we hope gets after our mission. Brooke, and I'll ask you that second question, the American dream. So w- one of the earliest, I would say lessons that my parents uh, taught me, right? And I grew up working in, in, in the fields from California up to Montana, picking crops, mm-hmm. whether it was asparagus, cherries, whatever the case may be, right? But one of the earliest things that, that they told me besides working hard is we're working for that American dream, right? The dream of home ownership. And I know you've made that happen for many, many of years, Brooke. How did you start? How do you feel where we're at? What do you have to say about the American dream? Oh yeah, it's great question. I mean, it is so many people never get an opportunity to experience it. And when I was first in the mortgage business, you know, I started when I was 18 years old. I didn't go to college. Um, I got my GED and I got into the mortgage business and I started working for a living in the mortgage business. And um, it took me a while to work up to loan officer. I was a loan officer at 21 years old. And what I realized is I started working with all these military families because I was in JBLM market and I had military all around and I was working with military families left and right. And as I started having these conversations with my clients and getting to know them, I heard stories about, you know, generations of families that have never owned, always rented, always paid the man, always made someone else wealthy, and they never had the education to understand how this is an opportunity that they have access to at their fingertips and they just never understood. And this is what, this is what, you know, was how our education department was born out of this concept that holy cow, our military families do not understand how the VA home loan benefit works. They don't know. And less than 20% of our military use the loan. So there's a problem here. So that really is, for me, the mission for the American dream is to be able to provide our military service members with a piece of the land, you know, because when you buy a house, you buy, you buy a piece of land, right? Underneath it that the house is sitting on to buy a piece of land that you fought to protect. Why shouldn't you have the ability to do that? And when you're getting this BAH, you know, 20 year career in the military, you could be earning a half a million dollars in BAH, half a million dollars. If you're not investing that in yourself, mm. it's just going right back to the government. So it's it's changing the mindset. It's making sure that people understand you too can qualify for this. This is a benefit that you earn through your service, not a loan program. And let us get you the information. So at least you can make an informed decision. Right. <clears throat> John, I have a question for you too. Not everybody utilizes their VA benefits. Why do you think that is? Well, there's several reasons for that. You know, there's 18 million veterans in the United States. Only 9 million are enrolled in VA health care. Only 6 million are actively using their VA benefits. And Brooke just gave you the stats on the VA home loan. I think it's several things. One, I think it is apathy on behalf of the service member of the veteran, not uh, taking advantage of trying to learn all about their benefits, especially as they're transitioning out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two, I think our transition counselors uh, that do uh, transition assistance have got to get better and got to get better answers than go to the website or look it up in the book. They got to describe more, you know, because when I went to my transition course, 
I was stupider when I went out the door than when I came in. Okay. And I had more questions. Mission you know? accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then, uh, and then last but not least, there's not enough advocates that are pushing information, you know? So to, to tell young troops, Hey, look, you don't have to be a retiree to enroll in VA healthcare. You got a DD 214. You can do it. You can use your VA home loan more than once. Okay. Well, how many times have we, have, have I, or you had to explain that, Brooke, when we were with troops at Fort Polk and everything, you know, I just think it, there's a myriad of reasons, but the bottom line, the best way we can get after this is to continue to educate, which is why when we go out on our trips all the time, we continue to educate our service members, especially those transitioning, uh, our military families and the veterans so that we can get after this problem. There is a direct correlation between the numbers I just gave you and why 22 a day veterans commit suicide. Sure. Yep. Lack of benefits, lack of ability to go and get behavioral health uh, or any other kind of health. And it, it's a shame. And it, and it, it should not be like this. And I think we can get after it. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, kind of talking about this stuff, um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the Volanos, even that uh, brother of yours, Mark Volano, is, uh, you know, you guys like to do some PT, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, we did some carrying heavy shit. A lot of times we were going to do the Appalachian Yomp until unfortunately it got canceled, the 44 miles in 24 hours. How important is the physical aspect uh, of getting people moving and getting people I mean, I go into some of our branches and I see ping pong tables in there. Mm -hmm. And when I think about a military context of fighter management, meaning having someone that is at peak operating efficiency mm -hmm. when they need to be uh, at the appropriate time. And so you can't be there all the time. So you have to kind of have some decompression. You got to have uh, some time off and things like that. How important is this stuff to you guys to make sure that the Veterans Lending Group team is at peak operating capability. It's huge. Yeah, honestly, I think I think we could do more. To be honest, we you know we do a lot with emotional health, but we haven't spent as much time with the physical health. Um, I know for myself, we've been so busy, and I was a busy mom, and I made excuses, and I didn't make it a huge priority until this last year. And for the last twelve months consistently, I've been waking up every single morning and working out, doing you know, getting some sort of workout in, whether it's riding my mountain bike or getting on the elliptical, doing weights. And I Get with the movement, yeah, movement. And I yeah. know for a fact I am more clear and more mentally um, capable. And there's you know, obviously there's multiple sides of that. You can do yoga, you can do meditation, you can make sure you're eating healthy food that you're supplementing. Like all of those things are important and. We actually were talking with our HQ team about creating some sort of like competition. And that's why we were so excited about the Appalachian Yacht because honestly it got, we had 20, 30 people volunteer. They were all like, yes, let's do it. They're stoked. And you know, the prior service. So they miss that PT. They miss that camaraderie and that, yeah, the exercise. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I mean, it, it's huge, man. It, you, and, and you got to get moving. I think that's kind of it. Every day doesn't have to be a monumental uh, you know, I mean, accomplishment, but geez, go, go walk a mile, you know, jog a little bit, lift some weights, do ride a bike, do, do something. And, uh, and I think it's cool. And, and that stuff, we're always pushing that kind of stuff, but it's not like our, our team members aren't as well. They, uh, they do yeah. they set up hikes together, you know, or they'll set up where, you know, we, you, if you show and you, Hey, we're doing a CHS mission over the it's, you know, we usually get, we get, if we get a handful, if nothing else, of people that come and get their ass kicked for, for two and a half or three hours or whatever it takes them. Uh, you know, it, it, they, they like doing it. They enjoy it. And, uh, and we think it's important, whether it's a ping pong table, it, 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 I guess if we scooters. go on that front, we have scooters in there and, and that's just kind of, you know, we're not, we're not slow. We're, we're busy, man. These guys are humping. They're, they're going after it. And there just becomes uh, a time where, man, you got to check out for a few, you got to just put it on hold and go do something stupid, uh, just to bring you back. And, uh, and so, and, and we've seen it. I mean, everybody really appreciates that stuff that gets used. Uh, pretty heavily. And, um, and I think it keeps everybody on track. You know, I, I use this phrase all the time and I use it in the military. The best relationships are built off shared hardships sure, and, and caring, as you talked about, Mike. So you remember friends of ours, friends of Veterans Lending Group, 
you know, Monty Jefferson and Erica Vinson were leaving mm -hmm. the JBLM area and it was Monty's retirement and yep. they were getting ready to leave. So we did a carrying heavy shit session yep. at Chambers Bay, two laps, seven miles. Yeah, that was a big a total, one. It was total weight of about 600 pounds we had to carry, yeah. you know, and uh, but we stopped halfway through to honor Monty's retirement and yep. we drank three, three bottles of soju in That's the right. middle. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and so, and it wasn't and then, flavored. No, and it wasn't flavored. No self-respecting <laughs> drunk drinks flavored soju. Sandra Troxel. <laughs> but and then we saddled back up with all of this heavy shit after we were half in the bag, and we carried it another lap around. Yeah, I I just can't think of, you know, I'm not trying to glamorize alcohol, but you know, I do like to have adult beverages, as you all know. Mm -hmm. But putting together the team with this difficult mission that we put in front of ourselves of going seven miles with all of this heavy shit and then stopping midway and honoring somebody who gave 30 years of their life right. to the military with three bottles of soju and then not killing ourselves by, you know, falling off the bridge, half in the bag, going yeah. back and finishing it. I, I don't know how it gets any better than that in terms of building cohesive organizations, you know, and, uh, and it's just a, a, it was a pleasure to have you guys there. So now oh, we're getting down. We loved we're getting, it. Yeah. We're getting down to the end and we got to do some rapid fire here. Okay. My man, I'm going to let the Marine do some rapid fire on you guys here. All right. So, you know, yes. you guys get fired up, lean forward in the chair because he's going to hit you hard. All right, Fonz, hit it. All right. Hey, before we start, we just want to say that we are giving away, right, some uh, books. Yeah. So this one in particular, like War, the Weaponization of Social Media. So if hey, let me let me say something about that. I will tell you if if you want to know what the next uh, kind of uh, character of conflict, the generation of conflict is going to look like, get this book by Peter Singer. Uh, it's called Like War, and it talks about social media as a weapon. And when you talk about the thousands upon thousands of bots and trolls from mm -hmm. Russia and China and other countries that are in our networks that are in our grids and are looking to do some malign activity to the United States, our partners and allies, this will open your eyes and it will potentially uh, will, will scare the shit out of you because <laughs> this is what warfare is going to look like in the future and, and why guys like uh, Scott Stalker at U.S. Space Command and our folks at Cyber Command and Stratcom are so important to the mission. So like war, we're going to give it away and Fonz, how can they win it? Hey, comments. So we're going through your comments right now, everyone. Post some comments or if you have some questions and we'll uh, give you some books out there dependent on your interaction in the comments box. Ooh. All right. So now we're going to go to rapid fire. rapid fire. All right. Oh, here we go. Good. So either Mike or Brooke, nobody is specific. So here we go. What is your favorite holiday movie and what does that say about you? Ooh, uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Same. Uh, it <laughs> says that we're freaking awesome. I Have love you ever Chevy seen that movie? Chase. <laughs> I mean, awesome. that is a classic movie. That's a great movie. If you don't like it, I don't is know. Is that the squirrel in the Christmas tree? Yes. Yes. And the, <laughs> yeah, and the man. mint she jealous jello. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so much. All right, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> if, if you could have coffee with any historical figure, who would you choose? Oh, my gosh. Abraham Lincoln. Why? I don't know. Why? Because he was, because of his leadership style and because he's an incredible historical figure, I just would like to pick his brain and ask him questions. I don't know, because I, I find him to be fascinating. Okay, here we go. What is a funny story your family tells about you that you'd like to share? Mike. Oh, shit. <laughs> Are you trying? Are you like <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Tell the I world. Think, I think what John is talking about is I uh, I believe I had forgot our anniversary, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I was catching a little bit of heat on this one. We were all together. The Troxels were there. We had a bunch of people there, uh, you know. And uh, ultimately, you know, somebody said I had to like smoke one, and uh, you know, an appendage, as John puts it. And and uh, but I guess the good news was I I didn't have to fondle anything. And yeah, that, that was the win. Awesome. That was also the night that, uh, you know, after so many bottles of liquor and so many bottles of beer, 
yeah. that the VLG team decided we're going to do 44 and 24. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always – John gets us drunk, and then we volunteer for shit. Man. I know I'm on to you, man. Smart strategy. Yeah, you're smart. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here's another. What is one piece of advice you'd give to someone starting in your career? Uh, you want to go? You wanna, Do uh, everything we say. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, that's okay. that's that's a good one. And prepare, you know, and, and prepare for a good long ass kicking because that's what it is to get to get going in our career. It's not easy. What is one lesson in your job that has taught you? that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? Oh, be humble. Definitely. Yeah, a mistake, any mistake, right? That just puts you in that thing where it's like, man, I, I did that. There's just no, there's no getting around it. Um, yeah, I, I think Accountability. Be owning accountable. it, that's right. Owning it immediately, coming, looking for solutions, bringing solutions back to somebody that'll, you know, that, and, and like we say, eat the frog, man, just do it, get it over with and move forward. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. What do you think the world will look like in five years for you? The whole world? For us or? For you. For us. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Oh. <laughs> um, BLG will be a national company. Right now we're national, but we will be in like probably another 30 locations in five years down the road. Mm -hmm. We'll have another 300 employees because we're growing. So we've got that momentum now and now it's just rolling. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, education is going to be educating military families across the country every day. Yeah. I think for Brooke and I, it'll be, you know, we're, we're both still mildly in production. We won't be in production any longer. This, this will be just a matter of kind of leading leaders, get, getting around to our branches, trying to, we, we would like to remain relevant. We still want to know uh, people and show face and, you know, walk in an office and not have people be like, oh my gosh, who is, uh, you know, we, we don't want that at all. So I, I think, I think that's what it'll look like for us. It's, uh, you know, making uh, less bigger decisions, less decisions, but they are oh, bigger decisions. I was like, okay. Brooke, and how many cities are we in right now across the, the nation? Oh, I knew you were going to ask that. I think we have right now, I think we have 20 locations. And so some of them, mm, I would say about 20 different cities. 20 different cities. And that is the rapid fire, John. Boom. Ooh. Hey, so we got to talk about some key things coming up. We're opening a branch right outside Fort Riley coming up soon. Any update on that? Grand opening. Um, yeah, we're working with the city of Fort Riley right now, trying to close off the street. And Brandy is going to go present that in front of a, um, the committee. Uh, yeah, so we do have a grand opening coming up. We're going to do some education in Fort Riley prior to the grand opening. Right now, it looks like the dates are the um, 18th, 19th. We're going to do probably a two-day grand opening because um, we want John there to sign e-tools one of the days. And then he's got to oh. he's got to hit the road and get to his next uh, duty station or next uh, speaking engagement. Mm -hmm. So awesome. we will post those when we solidify the dates. We will post those right now. They're a little soft, but we'll post those on our page and make sure everybody's got the information on social media. We awesome. uh, we also just squared away our space in uh, in North Carolina, Fort Bragg, Fayetteville, right outside of Fort Bragg. Uh, that one will be rocking and rolling soon. And, you know, I, uh, Temecula, California is next up. So we've... Uh, and then Clarksville. And then Clarksville. I mean, so, yeah, we're, we're really, we're stacking them. Let's, let's go. Let's keep rolling. Rolling. Amen. You know, it, it, we're not here to take part. We're here to take over. Amen. <laughs> hey, we're going to get after it. You know? Yeah. So, hey, uh, so... Uh, to our audience, thanks for tuning in for the E-Tool Nation podcast. Victoria, do we have somebody that uh, we are going to award the book to? Do we have a name? Ha! Oh, Maggie, Maggie Pepper. Peppers. One of my nice. fellow paratroopers. One of the Very cool. Congrats, I know. And there's another paratrooper, Joe Chad Nicky. Oh, nice job, Joe. Oh, that's Both awesome. Joe and Maggie, 82nd Airborne Division, veteran paratroopers. I've served with them both. Wonderful Americans. You're the winners of the, the book, Like War, and uh, we'll get that to you as soon as possible. Enjoy. Uh, so Mike and Brooke, one, thank you so much for your leadership. I know how busy both of you are. Uh, Fonz and I know it very well. Taking time out to be the first guest ever on the E-Tool Nation podcast has been awesome. Uh, it's an honor to 
have you guys here. It's an honor to be on the VLG team, but most importantly, it's an honor to call you guys friends. And can't Thank wait you. till we get together again for either a carrying heavy shit session, a shot of soju, or whatever it is, or karaoke. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, we love you guys, man. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invite to get us out here. That means the world to Brooke and I. Can't and, wait to uh, see you guys in Fort Riley. Absolutely. Boom. All right, Fonz. Keep on Aloha. Passing, devil dog. We will Hoorah. see you all Aloha. soon for another edition of E-Tool Nation. Keep pounding. Yeah. Boom. Boom.